Hey everybody, my name is Hendrik and this is my friend Anthony. Hello everyone. Um, we're both tutors that are part of Comer Tutors um, and our job is to hopefully read something with you guys that'll be a little bit fun. So today we're going to be reading Treasure Island. It's a really famous adventure book by Robert Louis Stevenson and it's about the stories of a boy who gets involved with pirates and ends up having this really amazing adventure. And I hope you guys enjoy the story with us. Um, we're going to break this video up into a couple different segments. So hopefully you'll enjoy um, the series. Part one, the old buccaneer. The old sea dog at the Admiral Benbow. Choir, Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace 17 and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in and the brown old seaman with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday. As he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow, a tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulder of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with black, broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking around the corner and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo ho ho and a bottle of rum, in the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of stick, like a handspike that he carried. And when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum, this, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, he said at length, and a pleasant situated grog shop. Much company, mate. My father called him no, very little company. The more was the pity. Well then, said he, this is the berth for me. Hear you, matey, he cried to the man who trundled to the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. And that head up there to watch ships off. What you mot call me? You mot call me captain. Oh, I see that you're at there. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or a skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had sent him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he had inquired what inns there were along the coast, and hearing hours well spoken of, I suppose, and described it as lonely, had chosen it from others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor near the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first, we thought 
It was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question. But at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman did pull, put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor. And he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg. And I let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came around, I applied to him for my wage, who would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my four penny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now, the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who had never had but the one leg. And that in the middle of his body, to see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether, I paid pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry. And then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. All the neighbors joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits, he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all round. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put. And so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were, about hanging, and walking the plank, and storms at sea, and the dry tortugas, and the wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life amongst some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying that the inn would be ruined, for people would cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back, they rather liked it. It was fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him calling him a true sea dog and a real old salt and such like names and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way indeed, he bade fair to ruin us for he kept on staying week after week and at last month after month so that all the money had been long exhausted and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If ever he mentioned it, the captain blew his nose so loudly that if you might have said he roared, 
and stared my poor father out of the room. I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff. And I am sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which, before the end, was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us has had ever seen open. It was only once crossed, and that was towards the end, when my poor father was far gone from the decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner for my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, the neat, bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the coltish country folk, and above all, with that filthy, heavy, leered scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. Suddenly, he, the captain that is, began to pipe up his eternal song. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of one of the old one-legged seafaring men. men. But by this time, we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey. And on him, I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for the rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music and at last clapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while. Flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous low oath. Silence there, between decks. Were you addressing me, sir? Says the doctor. And when the ruffian had told him with another oath that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasp knife, knife and balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise, upon my honor, you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since now I now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate, and if I ever catch breath of a complaint against you, 
if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's. I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door and he rode away. But the captain held his peace that evening and for many evenings to come. Black Dog Appears and Disappears. It was not very long after this that there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of the captain, though not, as you will see, of his affairs. It was a bitter, cold winter with long, hard frosts and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily and my mother and I had all the in upon our hands and were kept busy enough without paying much regard to our unpleasant guest. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching frosty morning, the cove all gray with hoar frost, the ripple lapping softly on the stones, the sun still low and only touching the hilltops and shining far to seaward. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set out down the bench, beach down the beach. His cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of the old blue coat, his brass telescope under his arm, his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his breath hanging like smoke in his wake as he strode off. And at the last sound I heard of him as he turned the big rock was a loud snort of indignation, as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. Well, mother was upstairs with father, and I was laying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlor door opened and a man stepped in on whom I had never laid set my eyes before. He was a pale, tallowy creature, wanting two fingers of, of the left hand, and though he wore a cutlass, he did not look much like a fighter. I had always my eye open for seafaring men with one leg or two, and I remember this one puzzled me. He was not sailorly, and yet he had a smack of the sea about him too. I asked him what was for his service, and he said he would take rum, but as I was going out of the room to fetch it, he sat down upon the table and motioned me to draw near. I paused where I was, with my napkin in my hand. Come here, Sonny, says he. Come nearer here. I took a step nearer. Is this here table for my mate Bill? He said with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate Bill, and this was for a person who stayed in our house whom we called the captain. Well, said he, my mate Bill would be called the captain as like as not. He has a cut on one cheek and a mighty pleasant way with him, particularly in his in drink, has my mate Bill. We'll put it for argument like that your captain has a cut on one cheek and we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one. Ah, well, I told you. Now, is my mate Bill here in this here house? I told him he was out walking. Which way, Sonny, which way is he gone? And when I had pointed out the rock and told him how the captain was likely to return and how soon, and answered a few other questions, ah, said he, this'll be as good as drink to my mate Bill. The expression of his face as he said these words was not at all pleasant, and I had my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken, or even supposing he meant what he said. But it was no affair of mine, I thought, and besides, it was difficult to know what to do. The stranger kept hanging about just inside the indoor, peering round the corner like a cat, waiting for a mouse. Once I stepped out myself into the road, but he immediately called me back. And as I did not obey quick enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came upon, came over his tallowy face, and he ordered me in with an oath that made me jump. 
as soon as I was back again, he returned to his former. manner, half fawning, half sneering, patted me on the shoulder, told me I was a good boy, and he had taken quite a fancy to me. I have a son of my own, said he, as like you as two blocks, and he's all the pride of my heart. But the great thing for boys is discipline, Sonny, discipline. Now, if you had sailed along with Bill, you wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice, not you. That was never Bill's way, nor the way of such, as sailed with him. And here, sure enough, is my mate Bill, with the spyglass under his arm, bless his old art, to be sure. You and me will just go back into the parlor, Sonny, and get behind the door, and we'll give Bill a little surprise, bless his art, I say again. So saying, the stranger backed along with me into the parlor and put me behind him in the corner so that we were both hidden by the open door. I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, and it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. He cleared the hilt of his cutlass and loosened the blade in the sheath, and all the time we were waiting there, he kept swallowing, as if he felt what we used to call a lump in the throat. At last, in strode the captain, slammed the door behind him without looking to the right or left, and marched straight across the room to where his breakfast awaited him. Bill, said the stranger in a voice that I thought he had tried to make bold and big. The captain spun round on his heel in front of us. All the brown had gone out of his face, and even his nose was blue. He had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, if anything can be. And upon my word, I felt sorry to see him all in a moment turn so old and sick. Come, Bill, you know me. You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely, said the stranger. The captain made a sort of gasp. Black dog, said he. And who else, returned the other, getting more at his ease. Black dog, as ever was, come for to see his old shipmate, Billy. At the Admiral Benbow Inn, ah, Bill, Bill. We have seen a sight of times, us two, since I lost them two talons, holding up his mutilated hand. Now look here, said the captain. You've run me down. Here I am. Well then, speak up. What is it? That's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've took a li such a liking to. And we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square, like old shipmates. When I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast table, black dog next to the door and sitting sideways, so as to have one eye on his old shipmate and one, as I thought, on his retreat. He bade me go and leave the door wide open. None of your keyholes for me, Sonny, he said and I left them together and retired into the bar. For a long time, though, I certainly did my best to listen. I could hear nothing but a low gatling, but at last the voices began to grow higher, and I could pick up a word or two, mostly oaths, from the captain. No, 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 an end of it, he cried, at, he cried once, and again, if it comes to swinging, swing all, say I. Then, all of a sudden, there was a tremendous explosion of oaths and other noises. The chair and table went over in a lump. A clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain. And the next instant, I saw Black Dog in full flight, and the captain hotly pursuing both with drawn cutlasses and the former streaming blood from the left shoulder. Just at the door, the captain aimed at the fugitive one last tremendous cut, which would certainly have split him to the chine had it not been intercepted by our big signboard of Admiral Benbow. You may see the notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of the battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, 
showed a wonderful clean pair of heels and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. The captain, for his part, stood staring at the signboard like a bewildered man. Then he passed his hand over his eyes several times and at last turned back into the house. Jim, says he, rum. And as he spoke, he reeled a little and caught himself with one hand against the wall. Are you hurt? cried I. Rum, he repeated. I must get away from here. Rum, rum. I ran to fetch it, but I was quite unsteadied by all that had fallen out, and I broke one glass and fouled the tap. And while I was still getting in my own way, I heard a loud fall in the parlor, and running in, beheld the captain lying full length upon the floor. At the same instant, my mother, alarmed by the cries and fighting, came running downstairs to help me. Between us, we carried his head. He was breathing very loud and hard, but his eyes were closed and his eye face a horrible color. Dear, dearie me, cried my mother. What a disgrace upon the house and your poor father sick. In the meantime, we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought but that he had gotten his death hurt in the scuffle with a stranger. I got the rum, to be sure, and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut and his jaws as strong as iron. It was a happy relief for us when the door opened and Dr. Livesey came in on his visit to my father. Oh, doctor, we cried, what shall we do? Where is he wounded? Wounded? A fiddlestick's end, said the doctor. No more wounded than you or I. The man has had a stroke, as I warned him. Now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. For my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly, worthless life. Jim, you get me a basin. When I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up the captain's sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. It was tattooed in several places. Here's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones' his fancy were very neatly and clearly executed on the forearm. And up near the shoulder, there was a sketch of a gallows and a man hanging from it. Done, as I thought, with great spirit. Prophetic, said the doctor, touching the picture with his finger. And now, Master Billy Bones, if that be your name, we'll have a look at the color of your blood. Jim, he said, are you afraid of blood? No, sir, said I. Well then, said he, you hold the basin. And with that, he took his lancet and opened the vein. A great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. First, he recognized the doctor with an unmistakable frown. Then his glance fell upon me and he looked relieved. But suddenly his color changed and he tried to raise himself crying, where's black dog? There is no black dog here, said the doctor, except what you have on your own back. You have been drinking rum. You have had a stroke, precisely as I told you. And I have just, very much against my own will, dragged you head foremost out of the grave. Now, Mr. Bones, that's not my name, he interrupted. Much I care, returned the doctor. It's the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance, and I call you by it for the sake of shortness. And what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum will kill you, but if you take one, you'll take another and another, and I stake my weight. If you don't break off short, you'll die. Do you understand that? Die, and go to your own place, like the man in the Bible. Come now, make an effort. I'll help you do your bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him upstairs and laid him on his bed, where his head fell back on the pillow as if he were almost fainting. Now, mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience. The name of rum for you is death. And with that, he went off to see my father, taking me with him by the arm. This is nothing, he said as soon as he had closed the door. I have drawn blood enough to keep him quiet a while. He should lie for a week where he is. That is the best thing for him and you, but another stroke would settle him.
Chapter 3. The Black Spot. About noon, I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks and medicines. He was lying very much as we had left him, only a little higher, and he seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, you're the only one here that's worth anything. And you know that I've always been good to you. Never a month, but I've given you a silver fourpenny all for yourself. And now you see, mate, I'm pretty low and deserted by all. And Jim, you'll bring me one noggin of rum now, won't you, matey? The doctor, I began, but he broke in cursing the doctor in a feeble voice, but heartily. Doctor is, is all swabs, he said. And that doctor there, why, what do he know about seafaring men? I've been in places hot as pitch, and mates dropping round with yellow jack, in the blessed land a heaving like the sea with earthquakes. What did the doctor know of lands like that? And I lived on rum, I tell you. It's been meat and drink, and man and wife to me. And if I'm not to have my rum now, I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore. My blood'll be on you, Jim, and that doctor swab. And he ran on again for a while with curses. Look, Jim, how my finger fidges, he continued in a pleading tone. I can't keep him still, not I. I haven't to drop this blessed day. That doctor's a fool, I tell you. If I don't have a dram of rum, Jim, I'll have the horrors. I seen some on him already. I seen old Flint in the corner. There, behind you, as plain as print, I seen him. And if I get the horrors, I'm a man that has lived rough, and I'll raise Cain. Your doctor himself said one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. He was growing more and more excited, and this alarmed me for my father, who was very low that day and needed quiet. Besides, I was reassured by the doctor's words, now quoted to me, and rather offended by the offer of a bribe. I want none of your money, said I, but what you owe my father, I'll get you one glass and no more. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. Aye, aye, said he, that's some better, sure enough. And now, matey, did that doctor say how long I was alive here in this old berth? A week at least, said I. Thunder, he cried. A week? I can't do that. They'd have the black spot on me by then. The lovers is going to is going about to get the wind of me this blessed moment. Lovers as couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what is another's. Is that seamanly behavior now? I want to know. But I'm a saving soul. I never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither. And I'll trick him again. I'm not afraid on him. I'll shake out another reef, matey and daddle on him again. As he was thus speaking, he had risen from bed with great difficulty, holding to my shoulder with a grip that almost made me cry out, and moving his legs like so much dead weight. His words, spirited as they were in meaning, contrasted sadly with the weakness of the voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he had gotten into a sitting position on the edge. That doctor has done me he murmured. My ears is singing. Lay me back. Before I could do much to help him, he had fallen back again to his own, to his former place, where he lay for a while silent. <laughs> Jim, he said at length, you saw that seafaring man today? Black dog? I asked. Ah, black dog, says he. He's a bad un. But there's worse than him that put him on. Now, if I can't get away, no how, and they tip me back the black spot, mind you, it's my old sea chest thereafter. You get on a horse, you can, can't you? Well then, you get on a horse, and go to, well, yes, I will, to that eternal doctor swab, and tell him to pipe all hands, magistrates and such, and he'll lay him aboard at the Admiral Benbow, all old Flint's crew, Man and boy, all on him that's left. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate. 
and I'm the only one as knows the place. He gave it me at Savannah when he lay a dying, like as if I was to now, you see. But you won't peach unless they get the black spot on me, or unless you see that black dog again, or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim, him above all. But what is the black spot, Captain? I asked. That's a summons, mate. I'll tell you if they get that. But you keep your weather eye open, Jim, and I'll share with you equals upon my honor. He wandered a little longer, his voice growing weaker. But soon after, I had given him his medicine, which he took like a child, with the remark, If ever a steam man wanted drugs, it's me. He fell at last into a heavy, swoon-like sleep, in which I left him. What I should have done, had all gone well, I do not know. Probably I should have told the whole story to the doctor, for I was in mortal fear lest the captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But as all things, as things fell out, my poor father died quite suddenly that evening, which put all other matters on one side. Our natural distress, the visits of the neighbors, the arranging of the funeral, and all the work of the inn to be carried on in the meanwhile kept me so busy that I had scarcely time to think of the captain, far less to be afraid of him. He got downstairs next morning, to be sure, and had his meals as usual. Though he ate little and had more, and I'm afraid, than his usual supply of rum, for he helped himself out of the bar, scowling and blowing through his nose, and no one dared to cross him. On the night before the funeral, he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking in that house of mourning to hear him singing away at his ugly old sea song. But weak as he was, we were all in the fear of death for him. And the doctor was suddenly taken up with a case many miles away and was never near the house after my father's death. I have, seen, I have said the captain was weak, and indeed he seemed rather to grow weaker than regain his strength. He clambered up and down stairs and went from the parlor to the bar and back again, and sometimes put his nose out of doors to smell the sea, holding onto the walls as he went for support and breathing hard and fast like a man on a steep mountain. He never particularly addressed me, and it is my belief he had as good as forgotten his confidences, but his temper was more flightly, flighty, and allowing for his bodily weakness more violent than ever. He had an alarming way now, when he was drunk, of drawing his cutlass and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that, he minded people less and seemed shut up in his own thoughts and rather wandering. Once, for instance, to our extreme wonder, he piped up to a different air, a kind of country love song that he must have learned in his youth before he had begun to follow the sea. So things passed until the day after the funeral, and about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door for a moment, full of sad thoughts about my father, when I saw someone drawing slowly near, end of, near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched, as if with age or weakness, and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak. with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful looking figure. He stopped a little from the inn and raising his voice in an odd sing song, addressed the air in front of him. Will any kind friend inform a blind man who has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defense of his native country, England, and God bless King George, where or in what part of this country he may be now. You were at the Admiral Benbow, Black Hill Cove, my good man, said I. I hear a voice, said he, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vise. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw, but the blind man pulled me close up to him with a single action of his arm. Now, boy, 
he said, take me in to the captain. Sir, said I, upon my word, I dare not. Oh, he sneered, that's it. Take me in strict or I'll break your arm. And he gave it, as he spoke, a wrench that made me cry out. Sir, said I, it is for yourself, I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with his, a drawn cutlass. Another gentleman, come now, march, interrupted he. And I never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. It cowed me more than the pain, and I began to obey him at once walking straight in at the door and towards the parlor, where our sick old buccaneer was sitting, dazed with rum. The blind man clung close to me, holding me in one iron fist and leaning almost more of his weight on me than I could carry. Lean me straight up to him, and when I'm in view, cry out, here's a friend for you, Bill. If you don't, I'll do this. And with that, he gave me a twitch that I thought would have made me faint. Between this and that, I was so utterly terrified of the blind beggar that I forgot my terror of the captain, and as I opened the parlor door, cried out the words that he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain raised his eyes, and at once, look, the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much of terror as of mortal sickness. He made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. Now, Bill, sit where you are, said the beggar. If I can't see, I can hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. We both obeyed him to the letter, and I saw him pass something from the hollow of the hand that held his stick into the palm of the captain's, which closed upon it instantly. And now that's done, said the blind man. At the words, he suddenly left hold of me, and with incredible accuracy and nimbleness, skipped out of the parlor and into the road, where, as I stood motionless, I could hear his stick go tap, tap, tapping into the distance. It was some time before either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses, but at length and about at the same moment, I released his wrist, which I was still holding, and he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the palm. 10 o'clock, he cried, six hours, we'll do them yet. And he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so, he reeled and put his hand to his throat stood swaying for a moment, and then, with a peculiar sound, fell from his whole height, face fo foremost to the floor. I ran to him at once, calling to my mother, but haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by a thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had certainly never liked the man, though of late I had become to pity him. But as soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears. It was the second death I had known, and the sorrow of the first was still fresh in my heart. Thank you guys for reading with us. Um, it was a lot of fun, and we hope you'll join us next time when we continue reading this story. Bye, have a good one.